Hello, I'm Anna Wultus, and today I wanted to just give some further thoughts on uh, justice and natural rights and natural law and, and such things. So, one thing I wanted to point out is that what is justice actually? So, justice, I would define it as the proper ethical order as well as the implementation of the proper ethical order. I think that covers both common uses of the term justice. Therefore, it is possible to both do justice and to be just. Doing justice would be implementing the order, and being just would mean being aligned with that order. So, I think that's something that's very uh, important to put out there because knowing what these things are is very important to then define uh, what rights are and how they relate to this. So something a, a right is something that is good or, or righteous in a way. Therefore, um, a right would be something that should be properly done according to that proper ethical order, while a wrong is something that should not be done according to the proper ethical order. Now, of course, we're speaking about ethics. Now, I understand there's, that there's also rights and wrongs in, in procedural matters, but I'm sp talking specifically about uh, ethics, legality, and justice here. Okay, so having defined it that way, Here's one of my problems with natural rights and natural law. And I may have mentioned this before, and that is that under a natural rights system and under a natural law system, the proper ethical order and its implementation are derived from two different sources. And what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is when someone says that nature, according to nature, reason, logic, or whatever you consider the origin point of natural rights, that uh, it is perhaps wrong to steal, and, and you say that. Now, how do you actually actualize that in a society? What's not going to happen is that people automatically in their heads say, oh yeah, that's right, it's wrong to steal, so I'm not going to steal. In other words, it's not something that in the nature of a man uh, takes effect because people still steal. So it has to be something that is external to the man and therefore not within the nature of a man. Now, the external logic of taking a particular action is not very incumbent upon a person's ability or desire to commit such an action. For example, there's people that, uh, let's say, uh, physics, for example, people that try to fly when they can't, um, and people go crazy or insane, and they try to do weird things. And then some people who aren't even crazy or insane try to do weird things. So in other words, just because something is logical doesn't mean that that is going to bind someone. and Similarly, when someone does something wrong, it's it doesn't always happen that uh, nature itself, through some karmic force, comes back and punishes that person, at least in any quantifiable way. And I will point out that many a tyrant has died a very peaceful death, and his kingdom has prospered uh, long after he died. So, in other words, what I mean here is that nature in itself does not enforce itself. Nature does not produce courts of justice. Nature, therefore, only commits one half of the justice equation, that is, the principles. And even then, there's, that's something that's debatable. Now, the other half, then, for natural rights advocates, where does the other half come in? Now, for the original natural rights advocates, um, such as Thomas Aquinas and John Locke, they believed that there was a God and that nature 
rather than being the originator of good was rather uh, the, the sort of means by which good is transmitted to the people. And that through that, such things are expressed from an omnipotent deity for the nature that has been created. In other words, from an absolute point of view, if you had to ask Thomas Aquinas or John Locke what is the ultimate source of justice, they, uh, in order to remain consistent with their ideas, would have to say that it is not nature itself, but rather the God that has created nature. Now, on the other hand, let's say that you don't have that position and you take a more secular position of nature itself. Who is going to actually enforce these principles that are believed or perceived to be seen in nature? And the answer is not nature, because as I just explained, it just doesn't happen that way. The answer is another man, another person of authority. Now, this could be someone individually in their own life. This, this could be someone ruling over others. This could be a, a family structure. This could be a government. This could be some other social organization. It could be any number of different things, but this goes back to this idea that I put forward that it is a structure of authority. And I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. In fact, I think that that's the only way it works in reality. That there are these structures of authority and that justice in all cases is only implemented by structures of authority because hypothetically, if you had an ethical system, an ethical order, and no one enforced it, then what would be the point of having it? The answer is that there'd be no point at all. Because you might say, what if there is an absolute right and wrong but nobody chooses to enforce it, and there's no transcendent enforcer in heaven, there's no uh, karmic force out in nature, and there's no governments that are interested at all in listening to it, then you might as well not have it at all. Because what you then just have is an opinion that someone made somewhere, and that you might say is agreeable, but if nobody actually implements it, then it doesn't really have any value. Because justice is not only those principles of that proper ethical order, but also the implementation thereof. In other words, if you are going to be a judge, or if something is going to be a judge, then that judge also has to have an executioner. And if you do not have an executioner, then the judge is of no value. So, going back again to natural law, the judge is, according to them, nature, and the executioner would have to be the civil government or uh, other structures of authority. In other words, they have essentially a system that derives its origin of justice at two points, one being nature and one being men. Now, I will point out that in the execution of justice, being that of men, then for those men to execute justice, they have to put it through their interpretation of it. Now, by making the interpreter and the author two distinct individuals here, uh, or, well, if you could call nature an individual, two distinct entities, there you go. What you're essentially saying is that justice is derived from a figure of authority that garners an interpretation of nature. And at that point, you have a, a real vagary going on here. Because ultimately, there are actually different interpretations people can take from nature. And without one person 
rising up and actually enforcing a particular interpretation, who's to say that someone is right or wrong about it? Because if that person does not fall under any arbitration, then that means that that person is free to follow his own interpretation. And what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that while some may see the result of an observation of nature to be looking towards, let's say, mutualism, uh, liberalism, e equality, things like that. Someone else might say, what if I just choose myself? What if I think that maybe, just maybe, I can convince other people to make me better, and then I can be better? And, and that's where you get an idea of egoism, uh, which is uh, different from, of course, this mutualism. And I don't think that there's any solid argument that anyone could make that that's an invalid interpretation of that. And what do I mean by that? What do I mean there's no argument that someone could make? Well, the answer is because who then is going to be the judge of what is going to be a good interpretation of nature. Because then if there is someone who is a judge of what is a good interpretation of nature, then that person would be preceding in that interpretation in authority. And so then you have a, a hidden person somewhere who actually knows the right and wrong of nature, who then judges the people who actually implement that in their societies as to whether their interpretations are right or wrong, who then actually implement it in society and enforce that upon the people. And at that point, you have a, a similar point to what the original natural rights advocates we're arguing for, which was that there was someone behind it all who had created nature with a particular intent and that therefore there are particular uh, morals that can be derived from nature, but the morals which they believed could be derived from nature were ultimately uh, predicated on their own presuppositions as to the morals that uh, were right and wrong according to their religious viewpoint. So if you go back to Thomas Aquinas and John Locke, that's the viewpoint they take. So what I'm saying is that ultimately, to say that justice is derived from nature, while it might, it might make sense in a certain context, it does not make sense on its own. Because if you say that, what you're ultimately saying is that there is something which allows us to interpret nature, which gives us a definite answer of whether things are right or wrong. And if you don't have that as a part of your epistemology of ethics, then ultimately you're being very inconsistent. So going back onto that, then the question is, is there an objective right or wrong? And objectivity is a very interesting question because let's say there's a rock in a field, okay? And you were to ask me, is that rock in motion? I could say yes, I could say no, and both of those answers could be objectively correct at the same time. And the answer is because there is a principle of relativity at work here. Because a rock in a field, if it is not moving in relation to its surroundings, you could say that it's not moving. But at the same time, you could say that the planet itself is moving, therefore the rock is moving. And of course the, the planet is in the solar system 
and the solar system is in the galaxy and that's all moving so obviously the rock is moving or you could go down to a microscopic level and see the motion of the atoms and could say that because the rock is not at an absolute zero temperature wise that the atoms are vibrating around perhaps not as uh, loosely as you would see in a uh, gas or liquid but the rock is in constant motion so the, there's a principle of relativity here that is very important when you determine whether something is objective or subjective so an, an example when it concerns ethics uh, particularly about what I'm talking about right now is that let's say murder is wrong you could say that that's objective, but then you ask, why is murder wrong? And then someone says, because I say so. And therefore it becomes subjective. For, for at least the statement is subjective is what I'm saying here. I'm not saying that it changes whether it's objective or subjective. I'm saying that it is situationally according to the uh, phrasing of the sentence objective or subjective so I'm speaking linguistically here not uh, as opposed to the objective statement here so that statement has the implication of subjectivity however under a divine command theory if it is indeed a transcendent being that is saying that then it is an objective truth that something is wrong so, in that sense, there is a subjectivity about objectivity in that sense. And then you go further on. You could say, uh, so-and-so says that murder is wrong. That statement, if that person actually said that, that's an objective statement. X person said that murder is wrong. That's an objective statement. That's just saying that someone said something. And then you could say... X person says that murder is wrong and that if you murder, he's going to punish you. Then that's an, another objective statement. X person says that murder is wrong and if you murder, you are going to be punished by X person. And that's ultimately what uh, a law is, it, when it, uh, at least in our society, that uh, the government says something is wrong and we're going to punish you if you do that thing which is wrong. And therefore, because laws objectively exist in our, at least from a realistic perspective, I know that there's other perspectives in which you could say, oh, maybe, maybe physicality isn't real. Maybe information is just in our heads and, and something like that. But I'm, I'm speaking realistically here. Because laws objectively exist and because governments by means of their authority are what enforce justice in our society therefore we have an actual objective right and wrong relative to what the authority desires what i'm essentially saying is that right and wrong are subjective in that they are dependent upon a particular authority the will of a particular authority and that is, for example, the state. Or, if you want to go a more religious perspective, God. So, now of course, if you then take that perspective of God, then you have a perspective of universality for right and wrong. Because then there is someone uh, by which right and wrong is objectively subjective who has universal force to uh, impose his principles of right and wrong upon everything in existence. So in that sense, it becomes essentially a, a reality of the universe that right is, exists and that there is a wrong and that if you choose to ignore that, you're going to be punished. So that's a, a religious perspective, though. But again, if you don't actually have 
a solid perspective, a solid way of interpreting the world around you that lets you say that something is right and that no other interpretation of that thing is uh, more valid than this particular interpretation, if, if you don't actually have that, then it is subjective because ultimately it might depend on your society, it might depend on your personal preference and inclinations, but ultimately the highest authority that you can have is a government, uh, the, the state. So there you go. That's my view on objective morality. Object morality is based, in, in my view, on the objective laws, wills, and desires that authorities use to enforce uh, their uh, subjective preferences. I, I think that's how it is, and even from a religious perspective. Um, let, let's say from a, a Christian perspective, why are some things wrong and why are some things right? It is because the things that are right are things that please God and that add to his glory, and things that are wrong are things that displease God. And that's it. That There's no higher point. It's just based on the character of someone. Whether it is the character of a god, the character of a statesman, the character of a parent, or your own character, all these figures of authority have some form of will and have some form of power that they use to enforce that will upon their surroundings. So tell me what you think. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Are you afraid that this could lead to a complete moral relativism and collapse of a society? Or do you think that this could actually lead to a more peaceful society? Or what, what do you think this could lead to? What do you think could come out of this? Do you uh, perhaps have a better idea? Do you have a defense of natural law that can overcome my offense against it? Just tell me what you think. And perhaps we can have a civil conversation. If you want to contact me and actually speak on my show, I'd be happy for that. So anyway, thank you all for watching. And I'll be seeing you all next time on Wiltus Over and Out.